All right, module four is going to cover Newton's laws. So I'm going to just highlight the three laws right now. And as you watch the video, there will be some concept questions that you'll need to answer. And this will count as your, as your attendance for uh, this particular day. And you'll get a grade on it. So um, Newton's laws, first of all, are... We're going to concentrate on his three laws of motion. There's also his law of universal gravitation, which is probably more important than the three laws of motion. But right now we're going to concentrate on his three laws of motion. And it's important to note that Newton was not the very first one to come up with all these ideas, but he was the first one to uh, recognize that they apply universally and not just to things on Earth. So the first law is called the law of inertia. And inertia is basically your tendency to stay doing whatever you are doing, whether you are at rest or already moving. So if you think about, um, you know, right now you're probably sitting down watching this. Now you're not going to move from that sitting position unless there's a, a push, some kind of external push from your legs or somebody knocks you off or something from your chair. So you would stay doing that forever. And most objects will stay at rest unless something pushes them and accelerates them into motion. Also, think about a hockey puck on ice. Ice doesn't have much friction. Um, think about the idea that, you know, once the hockey puck gets hit and it starts sliding across the ice, it keeps going forever. And is if there's no friction to slow it down, it would keep going forever and ever and ever. So that's another state of motion, right? Just to be moving at some constant speed. So when it leaves, uh, when the, the uh, hockey stick hits it and delivers a force to it, it accelerates it at to some speed. And it keeps moving at that speed uh, until something acts on it, a push uh, another hockey stick, it hits the wall, it hits the goal, hits a person's skate, you know. But it would keep going at whatever speed it was launched at um, forever. So that's also due to its inertia, its tendency to stay um, doing whatever it was doing to start with. And those two things could be moving at a constant speed or being at rest. So the first person that actually came up with that was Galileo. And to give you perspective, Galileo lived from 1564 to 1652, and he died on Christmas Day. And on the very same day, Newton was born on 1642, and he died on, in 1726. So Galileo was actually the very first person to describe the inertia of objects, the tendency of an object to resist a change in its state of motion rest or constant speed. But Newton made it its very first law of motion and he included it in his three laws of motion because he didn't just recognize that it applied to things on earth, but he used it to explain why the moon kept orbiting the earth. So that then became more a, a universal application of that law. And so he made that the very first law. The other thing to remember is that the more mass you have, the more inertia you have. If you have two objects of the same mass, they have the same inertia. That means they have the same tendency to stay put or to keep moving at a constant speed. It's equally hard to change their motion. But the more mass something has, the harder it is to change its motion. For example, if an 18-wheeler was, an uh, 18-wheel, you know, truck, tractor trailer was, starting to slowly uh, travel down a hill, you would not stand in front of it and try to stop it because it has a huge mass. Once it gets going, it's going to be really hard to stop it, even if it's going really slow. But if you had a matchbox car doing the exact same thing, you would literally just put your foot on it and make it stop, right? So because it has so much less mass, it's so much easier to stop. Now, in order to change the inertia of something, its tendency to stay put, in order to set it into motion and accelerate it, you have to apply a net force to it. 
and a net force is a total sum of all forces. So consider a physics book. Now, a physics book sitting on the table has gravity pulling down on it, and the table is pushing back equal and opposite on it. And that is a balanced situation. It is literally moving, uh, not moving at all. It's staying at rest because even though it's got forces acting on it, the net force is zero because the upward force of the table on it, also called the normal force, is balancing the downward gravity force on it. So if you add those two forces, they're vectors. One would be positive, one would be negative. They would have equal numbers and they would cancel each other out. On the other hand, if you apply a force to the left that overcomes uh, friction, actually this is the friction force. So imagine that you now push the book and you let go of it. It's going to travel forward for a while, but it will start to slow down. And remember, if it's moving forward, but it's slowing down, that means its acceleration is in the opposite direction, right? It would, it would speed up. If it were going the opposite way, it would be speeding up. And that means that there's a force acting, a total force acting in the opposite direction that it's moving. And in this case, it would be the frictional force. The frictional force would be acting against its direction of motion, and it would try to slow down. So, in, so the net force is no longer zero. And so you get a deceleration, a change in speed over time. The net force causes the mass to accelerate. So there's a formula for Newton's second law. Net force equals ma. And the units of it are going to be kilograms times meters per second squared or a newton. So the unit for force is a, is a newton and the unit for mass is a kilogram and your acceleration will be in meters per second squared. You may remember that this was a part of a question, oh, actually the first question on your last test. So how do we find that net, that net force? Well, imagine that you have a 10 Newton force pulling it to the east and a 5 Newton force pulling it to the west. So I've drawn a diagram called a free body diagram that shows the force vectors acting on it. And I've drawn the 10 Newton force twice as long as the 5 Newton force. And I've drawn them pointing in the correct directions. So you can just see visually that the 10 Newton force is bigger than the 5 Newton force. It's also pointing in the positive direction of the x-axis. And the 5 Newton force is pointing in the negative direction. So I can say that there's a positive 10 Newton force acting on it. And at the same time, a negative 5 Newton force. So the net force would be 5 newtons to the right, positive 5 newtons. And if I wanted to find its acceleration, then I would want to rearrange my equation for acceleration. And that would mean that I would divide both sides by that. And the acceleration formula is, in fact, and let's just copy that and put that over here. The acceleration formula is the net force divided by the mass. So if the net force is 5 newtons and the mass is 1 kilogram, then the acceleration will be 1 meter per second squared. A couple of other things to remember about net force is that for a given force, so uh, for a given uh, mass, so if I apply more force to that mass, so right now, if I applied 5 newtons, net newtons to it, it had an uh, acceleration of 5 meters per second squared. But if I applied 20 more, if I applied 20 newtons to it, more force to it, 4 times more force, it would have 4 times more acceleration. If I... Uh, applied eight times more force, 40 newtons, it would have eight times the original acceleration. This is called a direct relationship. The more force you apply to the mass, the more acceleration it will have and the bigger change in speed. That's very common sense. Just think about your accelerometer. Now, let's consider if I keep pushing on it with the same force, but I change the mass. 
If I apply 20 newtons to a 1 kilogram object, it has an acceleration of 20 meters per second squared. If I double the mass, its acceleration is 20 divided by 2, or only 10 meters per second squared. So that means that instead of doubling, the acceleration is one half as much. If I were to triple this, my acceleration would be one third of 20 meters per second. If I were to quadruple the force to, I mean, uh, quadruple the mass to four kilograms, it would be 20 divided by four, and it would have a acceleration of five. It would be one fourth as much. So when I do something to the, um, to the mass, the acceleration does the exact opposite. So if I double the mass, the acceleration is one half. If I triple the mass, the acceleration is one third. If I quadruple the mass, the acceleration is one-fourth as much. That is called an inverse relationship. And then the last of his laws is his third law. What he realized is that when, you, when there's an action between two objects, they will act equal and opposite on each other. So let's talk about that. So imagine that you're sitting on your tape, on your, on your chair right now. You are pushing on the chair with your weight. So the two objects are you and the chair. So you push on the chair with your weight of 180 pounds, and the chair pushes back equal and opposite with 180 pounds. When a rocket is launched, it pushes out gas, so the gas gets pushed out from the rocket. So the two objects are the rocket and the gas. So the gas gets pushed out, and that causes the gas to push on the rocket with equal and opposite force. When you shoot a gun, the reason why a gun recoils is because there is an explosion in the chamber, and that explosion causes there to be a push on the bullet. The bullet has very little mass, so it accelerates a lot. Inverse relationship there. The same push is equal opposite on the gun, but the gun has a much more mass, and it doesn't recoil with as much speed. Hopefully. If it did, you would die. So you don't want it to like be like that. So there's an inverse relationship between the mass of the gun and that and the resulting acceleration compared to what happens to the bullet. But it's all because they both are being pushed. One's being pushed forward and one's being pushed backward with equal and opposite forces. When you identify action-reaction pairs, you need to ask yourself, what are the two objects in question? So let's take the person um, uh, standing on the scale. The person stands on the scale so the two objects are the person and the scale. The person pushes on the scale, and the scale pushes back equal and opposite on the person. So the action is the person on the scale, and the reaction is the scale on the person. Let's talk about your weight. So you, when you are standing on the earth, you have weight. The earth pulls on you. And therefore, the two objects are you and the earth. The earth pulls on you with weight, and you pull on the earth equal and opposite. Now, if you were to step off a of ledge, you see the, that result of that pull on you. You actually speed up and get faster and faster, and noticeably by 10 meters per second every second if there's no air acting on you. Because you're in free fall, by definition, when you're in free fall, the only force significantly affecting you is that of your weight, gravity force. But you're pulling on the earth, too. So why isn't it rushing up towards you? Well, it is, but it is so much more mass. There is so much more mass acting on you, on, on um, so much more mass, that that little teeny weight of yours is not enough to give it enough acceleration towards you to be perceptible. And then finally, consider this apple. The weight of the apple pulls on the limb, pulls down on the limb. What is the reaction force? So in this scenario, the apple 
and the limb are the two objects in, in question. The apple is the action force, pull, the weight of it is pulling down on the limb, and the limb is pulling equal and opposite on the apple's weight. Now, what if I phrased it a little differently? What if I said the earth pulls down on the apple? What is the reaction force? Now the two objects are the earth and the apple, and you would say, the action force is the earth pulling on the apple, and the reaction is the apple pulling on the earth. Please complete the questions in this video in order to get uh, attendance credit for being in class today. And um, we'll see each other when we see each other.